There's this uh, fascinating pattern in the book of Acts when God intervenes and does something miraculous. It's a twofold pattern. People, individuals, individual persons are blessed when God acts in miraculous ways. But not just individuals. There is a larger work, a larger purpose, a larger meaning, much more things that are accomplished than just the blessing of specific individuals. Take Tabitha, for example. We watched her. We looked at her story a couple of weeks ago. Uh, She was a faithful follower of Jesus in the church at Joppa. She was known for her good works and her acts of charity, especially to widows. She became ill and she died. The congregation hears that Peter is in a nearby town. They send for him. Peter comes. And the Holy Spirit works through Peter to bring Tabitha back to life. Tabitha, get up, he says. And she does. Clearly a personal blessing for a wonderful person named Tabitha, also named Dorcas. She has her life renewed, more opportunities to experience the blessings of this life, more opportunity to serve as she had done so well in the past. But the blessing is not just a personal one for Tabitha. She was essential to her congregation, essential especially to the widows and all to whom she did good works and acts of charity. Their blessings, interrupted for a while by her death, Renew, they resume as God works through Peter to bring her back to life. The congregation at Joppa is strengthened by the miracle of new life for Tabitha. And the scriptures tell us that when people hear that God has brought her back to life, many people come to believe in Jesus. They begin to follow the Lord. So a personal blessing for Tabitha, but then God uses the miracle far beyond her own life. We apply the same principle to this earthquake, this chain-breaking moment, this intervention of God, this miracle of God at the jail at Philippi. Paul and Silas are in chains. They are fastened. They are in prison in the deepest, darkest parts, the dungeon, we might say, of the prison. And the text says that suddenly an earthquake happens and the door to the prison falls down. The door to their cell falls down. It opens up. Their chains are un fastened. It is a strategic earthquake. It is a pinpoint earthquake. The foundation shake, but the building is not demolished. The door opens, but the walls do not fall down. The chains are broken, but the roof does not cave in. This is God acting in a marvelous, miraculous way to set two people and their jail-bound companions free. And in this moment, there are wonderful personal blessings. The biggest one, the person most blessed, is the Philippian jailer and his family. He's responsible for the prisoners. The earthquake happens. He makes the logical assumption that they will take advantage of this event and they will walk away. They will escape. He knows he will be held responsible for their escape. He knows punishment is coming, maybe even corporal punishment. So he prepares for this inevitable and begins to take his own life. And in the midst of doing so, he hears the voice of Paul, don't do it. We are all here. And in those words from Paul, in hearing the voice of Paul, there is a salvation, an earthly salvation event occurring for the jailer. His life is spared. His reputation is preserved. Most likely his job, his vocation is preserved and he rushes to Paul and Silas falls before them trembles and says sirs what must I do to be saved a salvation beyond this earthly salvation he's already experienced a salvation that brings him forgiveness that removes the barriers between himself and God a salvation that will enable him to be the person that God made him to be and to do the things that God has called him to do. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and you will be saved, you and your household. He believes, and he and his household are baptized. We talked last week about how in the ancient world, the leader of the household, if that leader made a decision, uh, moved in a new direction, then everybody in the house would follow along. Last week, we looked at Lydia, who was a wealthy person, and as a wealthy person, her household was much larger than her biological family. The jailer, less wealthy, his household composed of just his biological family. He believes, he follows Jesus, they do too, and they are baptized. This earthquake is a miraculous intervention of God in the world that blesses this wonderful family whose babies were crying all the time too, and it was okay. Even in church worship, it was okay. Blesses these families. This is a personal miracle for them. And then, of course, Paul and Silas. This is a personal blessing for them. Uh, They have been unjustly imprisoned, and and they have been beaten, and they are wounded. Their wounds have not been uh, cared for. Most likely, they have not received any food or water. Yet at midnight, verse 25 says, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. They are trusting in the Lord, even amid difficult circumstances, even uh, perhaps just as amazing. These uh, other prisoners who don't know Paul and Silas are not angry with them for keeping them up at midnight by singing. They are listening. They sense, they know that there is something special about Paul and Silas, and they want to be in on it. So the Philippian jailer and his family and Paul and Silas, they are blessed when the earthquake happens. Paul and Silas, their chains are broken. Uh, Their faith is, is validated. They receive a blessing that they will never forget, a constant reminder always that God is with them and will be with them everywhere they go. And yet it's not just these personal blessings through the earthquake that happened to the Philippian jailer, his family, and Paul and Silas. First, the whole church is blessed at Joppa. Uh, Excuse me, at Philippi. The whole church is is blessed. Uh, This is a Roman colony, and, and there were not many Christians there. The church is just getting started. And and it's the Roman magistrates that put Paul and Silas in prison. And and when they realize after the earthquake that Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. They realize that they've made this huge mistake. Combine that with an earthquake, one can make a pretty solid assumption that the church at Philippi is going to have some freedom now in their city because of this powerful display of God in the miracle of this earthquake. Imagine how encouraged the church at Philippi is to see how God acts and to have this wonderful addition of a new family to the church. Paul and Silas, not long after they are released from jail, will leave town. But they don't have to stay around to be ongoing encouragers to the church. The church has experienced a miracle that will give them encouragement and courage and energy for generations as they tell the story of all that God has done. But there's also this powerful element in the story of not just the display of God's power over the Roman authorities, but there is this, in the earthquake, there is this establishment of God's no to the way in which the slave owners, the crowd, and the magistrates were behaving. If we go back and look at how the slave owners function and the crowds and the magistrates, we see that they have within themselves a view that not every person is a fellow creature made in the image of God. There are some people that are not worthy of their respect, some people that they depersonalize and do not love as God created them to love. Let's begin with the slave owners. They own the slave girl. She has a spirit of divination in her. She's able to tell fortunes. They use this spirit within her to make themselves rich. She is not a person to them. She is an object 
that they use to increase their wealth. They do not look at her as a one-of-a-kind creature, person made in the image of God for whom they are to have reverence and to help. Instead, she is a person who exists only for their own needs and their own desires. And then when Paul and Silas cast out the demon that enables her to tell fortunes and the owners realize that they've lost their source of income, and they put, they bring, uh, they drag Paul and Silas before the, the crowd and the magistrates, they fail to see in painful ways Paul and Silas as fellow people persons made in the image of God. We didn't read this in the passage a moment ago, but I will read this again, how these owners talk about Paul and Silas. These men are disturbing our cities, verses 20 and 21, and are advo- they are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawf- lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. They are Jews. They are other. They are beneath us. They are not known first as persons, but they are known as members of this outside group, not like us, threatening our customs, threatening our way of life. And the crowds believe it. They buy into it. And they get angry at Paul and Silas as well. And the Roman magistrates then put them in jail. They fail to treat them as persons made in the image of God. And God's earthquake says no to their behavior. It says no to the depersonalizing, demonizing, and dehumanizing that the crowds are doing. And God's earthquake says yes to the slave girl's dignity as an image bearer. Yes to Paul and Silas as image bearers. Yes to the jailer and his family as image bearers. And even yes to the owner's crowd and magistrates as image bearers as the earthquake does not destroy their town or their lives but gives them opportunity to repent and believe in Jesus and become the people that they were meant to be. God's earthquake in Philippi 2,000 years ago says no to all depersonalizing actions in our own day. And his earthquake 2,000 years ago says yes to the truth that all people are God's image bearers, fellow sinners for whom Jesus died. And so we apply this to these horrible recent shootings In the mass shooting 10 days ago in Buffalo, based on racial hatred in a mass shooting this week of school children in Texas, we see the ultimate consequence that occurs when we fail to see all people as our fellow image bearers. As with the slave owners, crowds, and magistrates in Philippi, and so in our day and always, to depersonalize and demonize is to walk down a path that so often leads to violence. And so we pray for God to intervene directly in some kind of symbolic earthquake, a direct intervention of God to save us from ourselves and to help us protect ourselves and and further a sense of safety and security in our own land and around the world. And we also learn to live the lesson of the Philippian earthquake by committing once again to see and to interact with each other and every person that we meet as fellow image bearers, fellow sinners for whom Jesus died, people that Jesus loves. That doesn't mean we allow people to walk over us. It means holding people accountable without depersonalizing them. It means protecting ourselves without depersonalizing those who might do us harm. It means we don't objectify people for what they can do for us, as the owners did to the slave girl. Instead, we hold in our hearts reverence for all people as the one-of-a-kind creations of God that they are. 
I shared in our newsletter this week a story about my maternal grandfather. I called him Papa. He was a veteran of World War II. He uh, uh, lost his brother in the war, his, his younger brother. I didn't see a picture until a couple of months ago of my Papa uh, kneeling in Italy, 1945, in his army uniform, kneeling in front of his uh, younger brother's grave. And it was something about that picture that made me realize that from that moment on, every Memorial Day and probably a whole lot of days throughout every year, that Papa was thinking about his younger brother and that loss, uh, his death in that moment. Um, in Italy. But I also know that coming out of that sense of loss and that sense of duty, and because of the person that God had made him to be, that my grandfather, even though he wouldn't use the language that I'm using now, uh, even though he probably wasn't conscious of it, just had within himself, just the way that God made him, an instinctive ability to treat every person with respect and dignity and kindness as the image bearer, the fellow image bearers that they, every person he met, was. He didn't do it perfectly, none of us do it perfectly. He didn't do it consistently. None of us do it consistently. But but he did that work of treating people with respect and kindness and dignity, image bearers all. He did that work with all the, the love and grace and strength that the Holy Spirit gave to him. In our world needs people like him and so many other examples that are coming to your mind, I know. Our world desperately needs us to show that kind of love and kindness and grace to ourselves as image bearers, to each other in the church as image bearers, and to our neighbors as image bearers all people for whom Jesus died. I'd like it if God would do some kind of miraculous intervention like an earthquake to shake us up and put us on the right path. But that's not how God usually works. The Lord has entrusted us with a calling and empowered us by the Holy Spirit to love our neighbors as ourselves. May we do so through the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in and through us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, for those who have died so that we might be free those who have died so that we might be our best selves in our nation for our fellow citizens and the world. Forgive us, Lord, for the many, many ways we fall short and fail to honor their sacrifice and fail to live as you call us to live. Lord, we do pray for your intervention in all areas of pain and suffering and sin in our own lives, in our country, and in the world. And we pray, believing the truth of your word, that when we, individually and as a church, little old us, do something extraordinary, like loving everyone as the image bearers loved by you that they are, that you can be a change maker, a change, chains breaker, a way maker in this world. We are called to be your people so that you can do your work through us. Help us to do so, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.